I put these on this morning, and I said, uh, actually, when you're 70 years old, you need, you need things. You need props. Uh, you need, uh, even guys need a little makeup and stuff. And so I put these on as I was getting dressed, and I said, man, uh, that's a pretty cool-looking dude. Uh, <laughs> I said, I need at least one moment to see myself on the big screen. So th there, there I sort of am. Um, I can't see my notes. Uh, and I'm not really Hollywood, so, uh, but there, there you go. Um, I'm 70 and, uh, and moving on, as I say. Um, well, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Boy, uh, it's impressive uh, from this vantage point, a lot of, a lot of people and, uh, and a lot of listeners. I, I appreciate uh, the chance to, to talk to, to you about a few things, about investing and about... Uh, uh, movies, uh, which I'll mention in just a second, and, and thank you, Don, for uh, the kind introduction. I, I wasn't really sure uh, what Don would say about me. Um, you know, according to the recent buzz, uh, it could have been something about uh, General George Patton, uh, maybe berating a wounded soldier, um, or uh, a Wall Street version of Justin Bieber. Um, or maybe just a Kim Kardashian impersonator if, if you wanted to hear about my feminine side, um, which I'm sure you don't. Um, in any case, um, if you really wanted to know about me, just, just ask Eric Jacobson here at the, the front table, because um, I've told him a hundred times over the last few months exactly what a great guy I am, and he should be able to tell you um, as well. Um, it should have sunk in by now. Um, and it, it sort of reminds me of a movie, this is the movie, but uh, called um, The Manchurian Candidate. And, and there, there have been two, uh, most recently with Denzel Washington, but the first one with uh, Frank Sinatra and uh, Lawrence Harvey. You, you guys are too young to probably remember uh, this movie. But it was a, it was a movie about uh, hypnotizing American soldiers in North Korea during the Korean War. And, uh, and so the North Koreans captured uh, eight American soldiers and uh, hypnotized them uh, into repeating to the public when they got home to America um, that their autocratic uh, captain, um, their autocratic Captain Shaw, uh, as, as he was called, that was Lawrence Harvey, um, was the kindest, warmest, most wonderful human being they'd ever known in their life. Uh, and they would repeat that for hours and hours uh, when we, they went back to the American public. And because of this, the, the public eventually grew to love Captain Shaw, um, someone whose image resembled, uh, I guess, like the future Ronald Reagan, uh, or somebody similar, I guess, a real nice guy. Um, and Captain Shaw eventually ran for the, the vice presidency and things went on. Uh, you don't need to know the rest of the story. You probably know what happened. Um, but I remember the Manchurian candidate, and we're talking about the image here, and uh, uh, you know, who am I, and who do you think I am? Uh, and so, as a goodwill gesture, I thought um, that I'd invite reporters um, from the Wall Street Journal, um, and from Bloomberg, and the Financial Times, and the New York Times, and Reuters, and uh, not to leave any of you out, um, but I'd invite you to a. a to a Newport Beach round of Texas Hold'em. Um, and we'll, we'll flop the cards, and hopefully there'll be a pair of red queens um, on the flop, just like there was with the Manchurian candidate. And uh, the, I'll say to the reporters, I repeat after me, uh, Bill Gross is the kindest, bravest, <laughs> warmest, most wonderful human being you've ever met in your life. Um, hopefully that'll work, um, maybe not. Uh, but I thought to be fair, um, you know, I should take, and I've already taken some uh, self-help courses in hypnotism, uh, and I've trained myself. Um, uh, so that when I see a red queen, just like they did in the Manchurian Candidate, um, and when I play solitaire, um, I repeat the same phrase, but with a twist. And I say, reporters are the kindest, bravest, warmest, most wonderful human beings I've ever met in my life. 
And so playing cards, it seems, can be great therapy. And I've never been happier at work. Um, we have a new deputy CIO structure with six of them um, that's working fabulously. We've got a new CEO and president, uh, Doug Hodge and Jay Jacobs, um, exceeding expectations. Uh, and we just moved into a new building three weeks ago. Um, and if there's a happier kingdom on earth, uh, it may be 15 miles up the Santa Monica Freeway at Disneyland, but, um, but that's a fantasy. And I'm talking real time here. Uh, we're having a, a good time and we're a, we're a, a happy uh, kingdom at, uh, at Newport Beach. Um, okay, let me move on. And um, uh, for those of you that, uh, um, you know, would, would like to, uh, to have a memento of those red queens. I've, I've got a, a surprise in my, uh, in my pocket. Uh, perhaps some of you af after the speech can, uh, can come up and um, I'll give you one of them. But let me, let me now move to more critical investment-related topics, uh, not cards. Uh, and I, and I want to approach, yes, uh, this is my time to sort of commercialize, so bear with me, but I, but I think... Um, Hopefully, I can uh, give you a sense of, of who uh, we are and what makes sense in the, in, in the investment markets and what has made sense for the past 20, 30, or 40 years. So, I, I, you know, I hope there's some information to be gleaned from this, and, and so you, you just won't think I'm, I'm uh, uh, doing PIMCO bragging. Um, but let me, let me start out and, um, and talk about the total return fund and, and why I think it's been successful over such a long time, because that speaks to, that really speaks to, to PIMCO. Um, and, and to me, uh, the total return fund has been a Mercedes, not a Model T, it's not a Cadillac. Um, it's a Mercedes, uh, you ride in comfort and you ride with style and you ride with the expectation that you'll get to your uh, destination in the future, um, and, and maybe even the, the total return in the future. We like to think of it as the, the, a new Google car, I guess, in which, uh, yes, uh, you know, you still got to drive it, you still got to actively manage it, but uh, it'll be well engineered, it'll be safe, it'll give you exactly uh, what you want. Um, the total return fund will never be a compact car, or hasn't been for the last 20 years, for sure. Um, you know, it's, it's $230 billion and was, uh, as we know, uh, $280 billion just a short uh, 12 months ago. Uh, it's, it's the world's largest uh, bond mutual fund and maybe, uh, maybe depending upon where the Vanguard equity index is, uh, maybe the biggest, uh, uh, but, it's, but it's a big one. So it's not a compact car, uh, but it does what a customer wants it to do and that's to to outperform with less risk on a consistent basis. And so um, let me try and give you an explanation as to why. And, and this is uh, where I hope you won't think I'm uh, um, you know, journalizing and, and where you know, some of the information that, that I'm going to give, uh, you know, it can be very useful going forward. Um, in effect, um, you know, I, I think I'll be handing you the keys to the the PIMCO Mercedes or the PIMCO Google car of the future or, or even the PIMCO Happy Kingdom uh, that I just uh, described a few minutes ago. Um, so at PIMCO, um, you know, I and others at PIMCO have, have, have long been a believer in investment structures or templates. Um, I'm sure Morningstar, um, you know, views that as a critical and important element in managing money, for us, it, it, it's critical. A template it, it is critical, and, and I've seen them, and you've seen them too, uh, work for uh, brilliant investors. Uh, there's Ray Dalio and, and Bob Prince at, uh, at Bridgewater, just really smart people. Um, you know, whenever I read something uh, that they print, I, I'm uh, totally flabbergasted and have to, um, to take it home and, and read it over and over and over again. Um, you know, just brilliant people. But, but Dalia has got a template. He's got a long-term view of how economies work and how investment markets fit into that puzzle. And, and, and sometimes it doesn't work for them, uh, but usually it does. Uh, but it's the, it's the structural template that I, I think that's important for them. Um, you know, GMO, uh, Jeremy Grantham, they have a template. It's a different template. 
you know, it basically speaks to mean reversion, that, uh, and Dalio's does to a certain extent, but it's not the same. Uh, but it's a template, it's a structure that they follow. And of course, uh, you know, Warren Buffett at, uh, at Berkshire has a template, uh, um, you know, a, a safe and uh, secure, uh, basically closed end fund uh, that can't be disrupted by financial flows going forward. There are lots of others too, uh, but I think it's important to have a structural template. Um, and at PIMCO, um, we've got a template, and, and the foundation has always been based on three um, structural elements. And, and this, is, um, this is where I, I might be giving away the keys, but um, I, th I think it's pretty well known. But uh, you know, consider. Uh, at least, you know, how it, it might work for you or, or um, you know, for your company that, that you represent. Um, we've got, uh, first of all, a world-class bottoms-up credit analysis that, uh, team that, that I think every successful stock and bond manager must have. And, and so that's the, that's the fundamental necessary element. Uh, but in addition, um, you know, our structural template uh, is as follows, and it comes in three parts. Um, first of all, um, we do what we call Bonds Plus. Uh, we sell a product called Stocks Plus, but Bonds Plus you know, basically uh, is the strategy, and it was the, the first, um, and actually it did, this is one of the things I'm most proud of. Uh, uh, I had no idea in the 1980s uh, uh, Chris Dialinus had, had joined us from uh, the University of Chicago, and we were in touch with uh, Myron Scholes and so on. But um, but we devised this concept uh, that, that Peter Bernstein, the late Peter Bernstein, and and, and Peter should know because he, he 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 knew about capital market structures and wrote two good great books about it. Um, but we devised a product called Bonds Plus, where where you would join interest rate futures and uh, as ultimately as swaps came into the market, um, you know, vehicles that didn't uh, require very much cash. Um, but we would join that uh, bonds plus uh, with short-term six to 12 month corporate notes and floating rate notes. Um, in effect, we turned our treasuries into corporate bonds. Um, and, and that's why it's a little misleading when uh, you know, not to keep harping on the press, but uh, you know the total return fund uh, monthly numbers come out, and uh, and uh, Pimco increases treasuries or Pimco decreases treasuries. Actually, our, our treasuries aren't treasuries; uh, they're corporate bonds in disguise. Um, and and one of the reasons that we've been so successful is that you know it, it adds about 30 or 40 basis points a year with relatively little volatility, you know, surrounding it. It's not your typical corporate product with a five-year maturity or a seven-year maturity where spreads can make a difference. It basically, it just sort of uh, trickles down in terms of uh, you know, mist as opposed to, to heavy rain. Um, so that's the, the first structural element. Uh, the second has been an emphasis on intermediate maturities and, and rolling down a positive yield curve. Uh, not a great strategy in the first five months of this year, and, and one of the ways that uh, you know, a strategy like this can come back and bite you. Uh, but historical studies have shown, uh, there's a, a great book uh, by three British authors called uh, Triumph of the Optimist. Uh, if, you, if you ever have a long weekend or have nothing to do, which of course uh, we always have something to do now, um, but you can, get, you can get into this book like, it, like, the, like I did with the Bible when I was a kid. You could just read and read it um, and go over it and go over it. There's so much information in Triumph of the Optimist that, uh, that, that it's an education in and of itself. Anyway, there's that book, there's Ibbotson and Sinkfeld. There's lots of studies on a 100-year history of, of uh, maturities and how they perform. And, and what they show is that over a long period of time that a, that a five-year treasury or a five-year gilt uh, you know, basically has equaled, equaled uh, the performance of a 30-year treasury or a 30-year gilt. And, and uh, we're talking 100 years here. And, and right away, you, know, you must wonder, well, how can, 
how can a five-year uh, that yields 100 or 150 basis points less than a 30-year uh, equal the performance uh, of a, a long-term treasury bond or a long-term gilt? Um, you know, you must be, uh, you know, making a durational play in which interest rates went up and the five-year did better because it has less duration. Well, not so. Uh, the reason that it outperforms, basically, is that uh, it rolls down a curve, a positive yield curve, which is the essence of capitalism. And the five-year becomes a four-year. You get a capital gain. It adds to the total return, and it equals, over a long period of time, you know, the 30-year the return. Um, now, there's a lot of noise in a five-year treasury. We saw that yesterday. Uh, we're seeing that today. We saw that this year. We see it all of the time in which curves are in motion. There's a lot of noise there um, in the five-year, in the belly of the curve. Uh, but, you know, PIMCO thrives on noise, and, and that's basically what I'm saying. It's our second structural element. Um, the secret there is patience, just like with Dalio and with GMO in terms of reversion of the mean and those types of things. You don't want to overemphasize it when the curve is flattening, but, but a five-year versus a 30-year on a long-term basis with a lot less volatility is a great structural bet in a, in a structural template. And, and third of all, uh, in terms of our templates, um, we employ volatility sales. Sounds dangerous, um, is sometimes. Uh, not necessarily involving derivatives. I mean, we use 30-year uh, mortgages, of course, and they have lots of volatility embedded within them. That's why they yield uh, 60, 70, 80, 100 basis points or more than treasuries, uh, inherent volatility with prepayments. So, so selling volatility by owning a mortgage isn't necessarily something super risky, but, but PIMCO as well sells uh, you know, volatility these days um, at the respectable tails, I guess, of the marketplace and, and collects uh, premiums. And when markets are volatile, then uh, you know, PIMCO doesn't do so well. That, that's 2011 and, and that's 2013 with the, the taper tantrum. But, but otherwise, it, it's a good business. It, it's what Buffett does. Buffett, um, you know, in addition to being a brilliant investor, has an inherent insurance company where he underwrites risk. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, they make underwriting profits. Uh, a lot of the times they don't, and they just use the cash flow to, to make money with, uh, with riskier assets. But in any case, selling insurance is a viable business for uh, fire, flood, automobiles, and so on. Um, and, and people are willing to pay for that. And, and you would say, well, why, why would they be willing to pay for that? Well, why are people willing to pay for insurance? They want to sleep at night. And, and so at PIMCO, we're willing to sell that insurance, uh, we're willing to, to sleep less, I guess, uh, which is the, the follow-on element to it all. We're willing to sleep less, uh, but perform better. Um, obviously, the volatility has to be under, underwritten properly um, and priced appropriately. Uh, it doesn't pay to write insurance, uh, flood insurance, uh, before a flood. Uh, but over time, you know, it, it's been a, a very respectable structural template alpha generator. And so those are the, those are the three PIMCO structural tilts uh, that, that add about 75 basis points of structural alpha per year. Um, and it's, you know, it's not hard to win a race if, if you start with a 75 yard lead. Um, depends on the length of the race, I guess, and depends on the, the horses in the race. And if, I, I guess, like in the last five years, if, if they're high yield horses, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily uh, work too well on a comparative basis, but you know, over time, uh, the total return fund uh, can and has competed with those high yield horses with uh, a lot less volatility because of this structural template. Um, and many of you would be amazed because uh, we don't see that in the press at the moment, but as of this very day, as of June, is it the 18th or the 19th? Audience participation. 19th, all right. Uh, um, as of June 19th, uh, you know, the total return fund, long lambasted as uh, underperforming, uh, is outperforming its index uh, by a, a decent margin, uh, yeah, before fees, but um, outperforming its index. And, and yet, uh, to complain and to whine, uh, you know, we're $50 billion poorer uh, 
you know, over the last 13 months. It, it, it makes you wonder uh, why that would be. And uh, you know, uh, perhaps we haven't been using enough red queens, I, I, I guess. Um, uh, in any case, uh, this is the end of the PIMCO commercial, which I thought would be uh, helpful to, to all of you, uh, maybe in your own experience. Um, uh, I actually hope you haven't been listening, um, but I, I thought uh, at least that you deserve to know because uh, you're here, and, uh, and that says something. Um, in, the, in, the minutes of follow, in the minutes that follow, however, uh, let me focus on the markets. Uh, on value and timing and decisions that make headlines um, and a good portion of additional alpha for uh, good and excellent uh, investment managers, whether they be in bond stocks or any other asset category. And, and today the, the focus, and yesterday the, the focus, uh, was and is on central banks and their policies and uh, what we at PIMCO call the new neutral. Um, the new neutral, um, and uh, we thought we, we we thought we were uh, we were uh, usurped by by Bloomberg on this because uh, uh, they had a report about two months ago and it uh, was headlined with the new neutral. But um, a Bloomberg reporter uh, this morning was uh, gracious enough to say, "No, um, you actually thought it up uh, an Australian." Uh, team, uh, PIMCO team, uh, first introduced new neutral. So it's, so this one's ours, uh, baby, for better or for worse, I guess. Uh, sort of like the new normal. Um, you know, it's nice to have something to be known by as long as it works. The, the new normal worked pretty well um, and has. We've had a 2% economy for five years now, and uh, that's certainly a new normal. Um, what PIMCO didn't do, to, to, to be fair and honest, was to translate the new normal into uh, the fact that stocks uh, might double uh, and that uh, monetization might flow into financial assets as opposed to the, the slower real economy. Um, so we sort of missed the most important part, but, um, but we got the new normal. Um, and hopefully we, we've got the new neutral, uh, which I think is a critical uh, idea, thought piece, uh, for all of you as investors and certainly for uh, central bankers around the world. Um, we would say, um, you know, to mimic uh, the, the movie again, that the new neutral is simply the biggest, the most critical, the most significant, the most important uh, element in asset pricing today or in the past. Um, the problem being that there are, we have very few red queens uh, to convince you um, that that's the case. Um, the policy rate, though, along with uh, forward expectations and volatility, corporate and equity risk premiums, um, has always provided the fundamental foundation for asset prices. It, 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 it is the foundation, you know, the short-term rate and the expectation for it going forward, and that leads to prices for 10-year treasuries and 30-year treasuries and stocks and PEs and risk premiums and all of that, and it, it all starts with the policy rate. And so if, if you can get the policy rate right, if, if you can formulate uh, a structural template around the new neutral um, and get it right, then you you got some money in the bank for your clients. Um, but the new neutral policy rate in, in real and certainly no, nominal terms changes uh, over time, and that's, that's the problem. Um, the idea of a, of a neutral policy rate was created by uh, a gentleman by the name of Irving Fisher in the 1930s. Uh, and Fisher went on to become famous by uh, speaking to a permanently higher plateau of stock prices. You've all seen that. Um, and so uh, people remember him mostly by that too bad, uh, because he was the guy that came up with a, the, the idea that there was a neutral policy rate. Um, in other words, he thought the real, the real rate uh, would be constant. He thought inflation would go up and down and, and policies uh, and Fed funds would change because of it, but he thought real rates would be relatively constant. It's there where history proved him wrong, uh, Fisher was wrong. Uh, the real rate is not constant. 
And that's the critical element to this new neutral uh, that we've got going. In the nearly 80 years since his um, original theory was introduced in the 30s, real policy rates have fluctuated between zero and 8% uh, during periods of positive inflation. And importantly, and here's the critical thing, you may not care about the policy rate, and hopefully you don't leave here thinking, uh, you know, um, how do I understand all this? Uh, the critical link it, is that bonds and stock prices over this 80-year period of time have been critically influenced by what the, the, the real policy rate was. I, I mean, do you wonder why stocks in 1981 sold at PEs of six to seven times? And you could say there's, there was a recession uh, and corporate profits weren't doing very well. But it was really because Fed funds, nominal funds, were trading at 20% thanks to Paul Volcker and real Fed funds that We've got to distinguish now between nominal and real. I don't want to get confusing here, but, but it's the real policy rate that's important. In 1981, the real policy rate was 7 to 8%. Um, and, and so equity risk premiums, in order to match that 7 to 8%, um, you know, had to go up substantially. And, and therefore, PEs, price earnings ratios, had to go down substantially. And so we had PEs of six to seven times with a real policy rate at 7 to 8 percent. It was critical for stocks. And, and if, if you'd only known what Volcker was going to do, it'd go to 20 percent in terms of nominal, go to 8 percent in terms of real, you obviously could make a fortune by not owning stocks or not owning bonds. Um, it was the same thing with long-term treasuries, 30-year treasuries, 15 percent uh, nominally. Why? Um, of course there was inflation. But the real interest rate, uh, the forward interest rate, uh, which investors didn't expect you know, to continue at 7 to 8 percent, but the, the, the forward curve was, was high in, in real space. And so long-term treasuries traded at 15 percent. And, and, and you know, it set the foundation for the 30-year bull market that, that bond investors have experienced and the 30-year plus bull market that equity investors have experienced. Over the, uh, the, the next 30 years, since 1981, uh, that policy rate, that real policy rate came down, 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 and finally, uh, in the past few years, real Fed funds have been negative, negative. We have a 25 basis point Fed funds rate. We've got 1.5% plus or minus inflation. We've got a negative 1.25%, 1.5% real policy rate at the moment. Uh, so it's been a long journey from seven to eight real to a minus uh, one and a quarter, one and a half. So the point here is that the, the real policy rate changes. It changes. Fisher was wrong. Um, and as the Janet Yellen recently agreed, uh, not yesterday, but uh, agreed in, in prior speeches, uh, she's agreed that, yeah, there is an evolving policy rate, not only nominally, but real. Um, she, she called it, uh, and she did, uh, it sounds, I mean, Janet Yellen is a very academic, uh, measured, uh, well-informed, uh, careful, except for six months, um, careful uh, person, but she described the real interest rate in Goldilocks terms. Uh, she said she, what they were trying to do was find something that was not too hot, not too cold, just right. Um, and the just right policy rate, whatever it is, the new neutral, uh, was going to be the rate that would produce 2% inflation and, and hopefully 3% growth, although they would take 25 or, or maybe 2 So something like 4 to 5% nominal GDP w was their target and is their target for this new neutral rate, uh, whatever it's going to be. And, and I might add third, and, and critically, um, People tend to forget this. Um, you know, the Fed really has a third uh, charge uh, these days, and, and that's financial conditions. Um, you know, the, the problem of Lehman in 2008, uh, the papers of Jeremy Stein uh, two years ago have all informed us, informed them that uh, financial conditions matter. And, and so while she may uh, dismiss to a certain extent in, in press conferences uh, uh, the uh, the current uh, level of finan financial conditions. There's no doubt that there's three targets 
that the Fed has these days, and that's, that's growth slash unemployment, inflation, and financial conditions. That's what the new neutral hopefully uh, will perfect going forward. Okay, so what is, what is this real policy rate? And, and is it really different and changing and, and newer um, than what we've seen over the past 25 years, or is it just something Pimka thought would be cool uh, to follow the new normal and to, uh, to, to solicit interest? Um, well, it, it's not. It is changing. Uh, you know, the Fed acknowledged as much yesterday when they, they changed the, the green dots, the blue dots, the dots. Um, in terms of their forward expectations, they, they brought down the nominal policy rate and the real policy rate, in effect, uh, by 25 basis points, and it's going lower and lower and lower. Um, so. So it, it, it is important to, to try and find out where, where it's going because it'll influence stock prices and high yield prices and spreads and all of that in consideration. One thing that PIMCO thinks it knows, one thing that the Fed thinks it knows is, is that the real new uh, neutral is not minus 1.25%, uh, which is where we are now. Uh, although to be fair and to, to stimulate uh, discussion perhaps, uh, the one and a quarter percent negative policy rate, real policy rate, over the past five years has not even allowed uh, the U.S. economy to, to, to reach the goals uh, of 5 percent nominal GDP. We've been stuck in a, in a new normal world of 4 to 3.5 percent nominal GDP. And, and so a negative rate uh, for a long period of time hasn't really done much. Um, the problem is, is that what it has done is stimulate investment markets, and that's where the financial conditions come in. That, that's, that's the real reason, I think, we think, why the, the Fed at some point will move and, and try and move the real interest rate higher from one and a quarter percent negative. It, it's too much of an incentive for, um, for hedgers and funds and levered uh, structures to, to make money. Uh, so they have to raise it at some point uh, to prevent bubble popping. Um, so it's not minus one and a quarter percent, but, but is it two percent, uh, which, um, and I'm talking real here, uh, again, forgive me, uh, just add or subtract two percent inflation whenever I'm talking about the real rate. So a two percent real rate means four percent uh, Fed funds at the end of the journey. Um, is, it, is it 2%? Um, because that, that's what the Fed currently expects it to be close uh, to, to where their destination is. And, and that, was, that was embedded in what they call the Taylor Rule. You all know that. You know John Taylor from Stanford, 1991, the Taylor Rule, uh, you know, the Fed and other central banks uh, glommed onto it because it made a lot of sense. And it did make a lot of sense for a long time. Uh, and it worked until it didn't work. Uh, and it didn't work in 2006 and 2007. Uh, and we had a real rate that was so high, uh, not, not mathematically, but so high, uh, that it broke uh, the US economy, the housing market, and, and the global economy. Um, so it was this combination of a, of a real rate and the levered structure uh, globally, financially, housing, uh, shadow banks, um, all dependent upon a low real rate. It, it was a real rate of uh, only 1% um, in 2007 that broke um, you know, the global financial markets that led to the Great Recession. A 1% real rate, because uh, the Fed went to five and a quarter, inflation was four, four and a half. It was only 1% real, and they cracked, they cracked the economy. Um, so, so that alone, I guess, tells me that to, to return to a 2% real policy rate, which is what Taylor embeds and what the Fed believes uh, in terms of their models, you know, it would be to dice with another layman-like disaster. Uh, this economy is still 350% of 
uh, GDP, debt to GDP. It's still as levered, although the, to be fair, the leverage has shifted from households to the government and it's safer there than on household balance sheets, but we're still a highly levered economy and, and so are other global economies. And you know, this 1% rate in uh, 2007 actually broke the economy. Um, you told me to wrap up. I thought it was short. <laughs> um, let me continue. Um, what other evidence do we have as to what the real rate would be? Um, well, there's, there's a study by the San Francisco Fed in 2001, uh, you know, when Janet Yellen was president there uh, by uh, two gentlemen by the name of Laubach and Williams. Um, and they did research on the real rate and how it changes and so on, and they've updated their model all the way until the end of 2013. Their information, it comes from the Fed, says that the real interest rate should be a minus 25 basis points, not 2%, uh, which is what uh, the market and Fed participants expect it uh, to be. And other uh, research as well. You know Rogoff and Reinhardt. I love Rogoff and Reinhardt. Um, you know, talk about research. You can, you can get lost there uh, for weeks at a time. And not necessarily that it's right, but, it, but it's, it's good research. And sometimes it's criticized and sometimes it's wrong. Uh, but basically, what they showed was that since uh, the last Great Depression in the 1935, that uh, real interest rates in the U.S. and the U.K. up until Volcker in 79 uh, were a minus 25 basis points in the U.S. and a minus 1% for the U.K. And, and so all of these examples say that in a levered economy, which is the critical element, which is what the Fed, in my mind, can't build into their model. This is a subjective uh, red queen type of uh, situation in which you don't know, you can't model, and, and so the Fed doesn't want to go there. They want to they, they gradually think that maybe things might change gradually, but, but, but a 2% real rate is far too high in a levered economy. Okay, um, i get a few more minutes. Um, I guess my point is, is that if the new neutral is closer to zero, uh, the real one, uh, which is what PIMCO expects as opposed to two, um, then asset prices, remember the connection to asset prices, that asset prices are less bubbly, that, that stocks at 16 to 17 times PEs can survive a mild bubble atmosphere with a 0% real rate. They can't survive a 2% real rate. We saw what happened in 2007. Same thing with credit spreads. Narrow, very narrow. Artificially priced, very artificially priced. Um, avoid, um, only if you think the real rate, the new neutral real rate is going to be two or close to two as opposed to zero. At zero, uh, things make sense. And it just depends upon whether the Fed and other central banks um, you know, proceed along uh, the expected path or whether they stop short. Um, you know, based upon what PIMCO thinks uh, is, is their ultimate uh, destination. So, that, so the new neutral is critical. Um, you know, think about it yourselves. Is it two? Is it zero? Uh, what should it be? And, and you can get into bonds with forward prices and, and, and forward yields, and you can get into stocks with PEs and all of that based upon what exactly that rate is, is going to be. And it, and it influences volatility, too. Um, you know, the, the lower the rate, the less volatile markets and, and the VIX you know, stays at 12 and treasury volatility stays at 60% uh, normalized, et cetera, et cetera. At 2%, uh, you've got bear markets ahead. So, so to hopefully the, the Fed uh, knows what it's doing as it proceeds along. Um, you know, is this a Pollyannish uh, argument for, for a bull market? Uh, not really, uh, because we know yields are low. We know PEs are high. Uh, we know growth is, uh, is being contained. And, and so most of the, most of the, the jazz has, has uh, already been enjoyed. Um, you know, we expect, for instance, in a bond market, 3 to 4% returns going forward. We expect on the stock market, 4 to 5% returns going forward. But we expect them to be relatively stable, not that there won't be ups and downs and 10% corrections and all those types of things, but, but if the Fed and other central banks uh, you know, stay low uh, and the new neutral is closer to zero than two, 
then we've got a market in which you can at least you know, take some measured risk and earn uh, you know, a, not a decent return, obviously not a decent return, uh, but a return uh, that uh, is positive and, and relatively less volatile. And uh, just to extend this quickly to the global uh, marketplace, as we learned last week, uh, you know, other central banks have other new neutrals that they're trying to find. Uh, Abe, Abe in Japan is trying to find uh, their uh, new neutral situation, although the policy rate doesn't change, inflation does, and so the real rate changes. Uh, Carney in England and the UK uh, probably will be the first central banker to, uh, sort of like Christopher Columbus, to, to sail, uh, uh, gotta get this right, uh, not to sail west uh, like Columbus did, uh, in order to find the east, but to, to sail up uh, in order to find you know, the measured uh, returns of the new neutral. Uh, we think the UK will go first, but ultimately they have the same problem. What is the policy rate and what prices in terms of equities and spreads you know, should reflect that ultimate destination? Um, for now, however, and just to wrap this up, uh, investors you got to make choices, right? You can't wait around, uh, go home uh, on the weekend and, and, and read uh, Triumph of the Optimist and start thinking about uh, what the new neutral should be. You've you got to have a, you got a portfolio and you've got to do something. Um, and I, I think investors certainly have to be aware of certain things. They've got to be aware of uh, quantitative easing and the end of quantitative easing in the United States. Um, that disappears in November as a policy choice. Uh, Long-term Treasury bonds have feasted on um, almost 100% purchasing uh, from the Fed over the past three or four years. I, you know, it is, it is hard to, to understand that every time the Treasury issues a 30-year bond, basically the next day, figuratively, uh, the Fed buys it. And so when they stop that, and they're starting to, what happens to a 30-year Treasury bond when it's buyer of first and last resort basically disappears. That will be an interesting situation and, and certainly influence the, the curve as well as the new neutral going forward. Um, take you back to the new neutral again as a close. Um, to us, it's the dominant policy. Uh, the most important, uh, the most wonderful, the most, uh, the biggest, uh, the Manchurian candidate type of question uh, for all investors uh, going forward. Um, and so it, it pays to, to at least have a sense as to where it might be. We think it's closer to zero, real, than two. We think that means that interest rate spreads, that credit, um, that volatility, um, are probably better choices than duration, although duration isn't, isn't a bad choice, but would probably be third or fourth. Um, and that, um, that a portfolio should be designed around expectations, um, informed by uh, the Fed, of course, by, by uh, question and answer sessions that we saw yesterday with Janet Yellen, um, but as well informed by your own subjective opinion as to why it would be low as opposed to high. For us, I cited the historical research, I cite again the commonsensical thought, in a highly levered economy, the new neutral has to be lower uh, than it was historically. Taylor cannot be right. Um, sorry, Professor Taylor. Uh, I'll, I'll take this on as a challenge. Uh, hopefully we'll both be around five years from now to. Uh, uh, to, to pay each other off. Uh, but Taylor at two is wrong, and PIMCO and Bloomberg at, uh, at zero percent. Although I think Bloomberg didn't really say zero. They, they said new neutral. Um, so I won't throw them into the pot. Um, but in any case, that's, that's the critical thing. And, and I think ultimately a portfolio, that this is a perfect portfolio for a PIMCO template, just to, just to finish it off. Um, our template, again, remember, you know, based upon bonds plus, based upon volatility sales, based upon uh, rolling down the curve uh, with intermediate structures. If the, if the new neutral behaves itself is closer to zero than two, then the PIMCO template uh, is in business. 
If it doesn't, uh, then markets are more volatile, then curves flatten as inflation goes up, uh, and duration is not a good bet. And so, again, in bond, in bond space, that's the bet, so to speak, in terms of what uh, the new neutral is. Okay, I, I know we got questions and answers. I, I want to, uh, before I wrap, thank, uh, thank Don. Um, thanks for putting up with my discussion of stamps at lunch. Uh, thank you, Eric, for putting up with me for uh, the past few months in terms of telling you how wonderful uh, PIMCO is with a little bit of uh, a uh, twist, uh, to, so to speak, and a bias, um, which is normal, right? The new normal. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, with my uh, sunglasses and my story about uh, the Manchurian candidate, I, I haven't uh, put off too many of you. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm not General George Patton. Maybe I'm just a 70-year-old version of Justin Bieber. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but thanks for listening to, to my late in life saga, uh, you know, we will follow the new neutral as, as we go forward. Uh, PIMCO will uh, continue to employ its structural templates. Uh, this company uh, is thriving in 2014. Uh, the total return fund may be just a little above its index, but, uh, but everything else, global, diversified income, hedge, um, boy, you would want, you would, you would want to own them. Um, and of course I do. Um, so th uh, thanks very much. Um, I'll, I'll leave you, and uh, after the session, uh, again, my, my calling cards have an interesting twist that, uh, that you may enjoy if I meet you up front. But have we, have we got time, Don, for... Uh, no, we've got no time. I timed this at 30 minutes. Did you know that? And uh, it's probably 45 or 50. That's the way it goes. Um, anyway, so that's my sign to uh, do the patent uh, sign-off, and thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.